afternoon and evening to our viewers across the globe and welcome to Vehau Inside Business's second episode of our live panel event perspectives. Since the first commercial flight in 1914 to an estimated 10 billion passengers per year in 2040, the commercial airline industry has shortened travel, created millions of jobs, if not billions, and connected people around the world. However, in recent years, the issue of sustainability and decarbonization is becoming a growing concern in the airline industry. Industry leaders are starting to take this issue very seriously, yet there is still much that can be done to build the future that we desire. Tonight, I have the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Rob Britton and Professor Arne Strauss to discuss what this future will look like. After graduating from the University of Trier and Virginia Tech in mathematics, Professor Arne Strauss has pursued his academic career at Lancaster University, where he earned his PhD in management science. Professor Strauss spent over seven years as a professor in operational research at Warwick Business School. For the past two years, Professor Strauss works as a professor at the Merc uh, Merc Mercator Endowed Chair in Demand Management and Sustainable Transport at VEHAU. Dr. Rob Britton was the Managing Director of Advertising of the Advertising Team at American Airlines, being responsible for brand development, direct marketing, and sales promotion, among many other things. After the tragic events of September 11th, he was part of the team rebuilding the American Airlines brand. Dr. Britton has also worked as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University and is a frequent guest lecturer at Feihou. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So to kick it off, when I think of sustainability in the airline industry, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is when I was booking a flight about some last, eh, it was before COVID actually, um, and on EasyJet, they have now an option where you can offset your flight uh, with, with carbon offsets and you pay, you know, an extra, this was from uh, Frankfurt to Barcelona, you pay an extra 15 euros and now your flight is, is net zero. Now, my question to you guys is, are these carbon offsets uh, a long-term solution? First of all, what are they? Second of all, are they a long-term solution or are, are they really just a, a cash saving temporary option? I'll kick it off with uh, Professor Strauss. Sure, sure. Hmm. Yeah, so my view at the end of the day, um, well, I don't quite see, I must say, how you can actually offset carbon emissions that are being emitted indeed very high up in the atmosphere with whatever actions are being done uh, in terms of planting trees or whatever at the ground. I mean, this to some extent can capture apparently uh, emissions close to the ground, but well, at least from an ecological um, point of view, that's probably a, yeah, a bit of a challenge, I guess. So as such, my personal view would be, even for I'm not, by no means an expert in that domain, I have to say, um, well, that I don't really see this as a long-term solution to the actual emissions problem, right? So it's um, just going to be well, something presumably that helps to compensate for other emissions, but presumably not so much with those high up in the atmosphere. So as such, the actual um, well, solution to the problem as such, I would rather see that in the domain of, which, first of all, reducing uh, flights, well, and secondly, measures such as sustainable fuels and things like that, improvements to uh, Air traffic control, especially in Europe, um, you might say something's later on that, um, and things like that. So it's my personal view, at least. Do you agree? No, I, yeah, I agree with with uh, <laughs> Professor Strauss. Um, if 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 we're looking at uh, the offsets that are offered by a number of airlines, um, you know, it's really you know the science doesn't really support it. Um, at the same time, you know airlines all over the world are under enormous pressure to, you know, sort of do something. Uh, and that's really what their response is. So um, at the risk of seeming excessively cynical in my old age, it's, it's really a bit of marketing uh, mm -hmm. and a bit of a way for, um, for uh, the, the, the consumer that, that feels essentially, I mean, let's be honest, feels guilty or may, you know, some sense of, you know, of, of guilt about this to feel better about what it is that they're doing. Now, and, and, and I completely agree with Professor Strauss that, you know, the, the, the directions that the industry needs to go uh, are well beyond those sorts of things. So a nice first start, I wouldn't say, I'm not going to, I wouldn't condemn EasyJet or anybody else for offering these things. Um, I think uh, they're, they're a place to start. And, and I think it's important at the beginning uh, of our conversation, Nicholas, to, to, to really say 
something that I think is often ignored in this discussion. And that is every member, every party, every stakeholder in commercial aviation, from the aircraft makers to the engine makers, to the operators, to the airports, every everyone that's involved in, in the commercial airline ecosystem, commercial aviation ecosystem, understands the problem. No one is in denial. And I think that a lot of people think that those of us that are in the business, that are in and close to the business, think we're you know denying them. No one is in denial. Everyone involved is intent on doing everything they can to reduce yeah. emissions, to create greater sustainability with what Professor Strauss mentioned, aviation fuels and more efficient routings and all these things. So we, we are aware of it. There's no denial in the system. And, you know, that brings me to a point. You said feeling guilty. Should we feel guilty about flying? Is this something, because I was, <laughs> this, I mean, it's it's something in the recent years that has become, a, a, it's a political topic. I've talked to friends uh, who, you know, are, they said, why why don't take the train? Why why do you fly, even though it cuts down on, you know, the time by you know, half or more? Um, you know, and then looking at, in, in preparation for this talk, I, I was looking at the overall emissions, carbon emissions, um, or carbon equivalent emissions that come from, uh, all of our activities as humans and the airline industry, I think it was something like 2%, two, two to 3%, something like this. Mm -hmm. So, I, well, I, would, I don't even know if there's a question there. Yeah, no, I would say it this way. Uh, and, and this is, again, I think one of these points that uh, may be useful to, to, to introduce early on. Uh, and that is when, when I a moment ago, I mentioned the sort of this this idea that that everyone in the commercial aviation ecosystem understands the issue, wants to reduce, wants to improve sustainability, do all these things. At the same time, I think we need to understand, in a, in a sort of a cost benefit analysis, what do we get for the two to three percent? Okay, so let's say, okay, yeah, right, okay, it's two to three, two to three percent. What do we get for that? And the reality is, is that we get an we being societies and economies get enormous benefits. Let's talk about what those benefits are. We get global market expansion. We get the opportunity for a German company in the Mittelstand to grow their markets globally because, you know, there's only so much that, that can be sold within Germany. So we get global market expansion. We get the flow of human capital, the flow of expertise. Um, I remember being in a gym in Santiago, Chile, and I met a guy who was an electrical engineer for Siemens helping the Chileans with their power grid. That's the kind, so flow of human capital. We get educational exchange. Vejao is full of students that are here from other places. And all of that educational exchange, all of that cultural exchange comes. What else do we get? We get tourism by many measures, the world's largest single industry, you know, and a great industry to, to, to have. We get just-in-time logistics. We get all of these things. So while people can criticize and they can say, this is, you know, flying is sinful or flying is evil, my put back to them is, well, we're getting an awful lot for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, please. Just to answer that, so I absolutely agree on this. Uh, once at the end of the day, it's we're looking at both sides, not just uh, to criticize people for flying lead around. Um, I, mean, I would say, though, that uh, it's also worthwhile reflecting to what extent, indeed, what precisely those benefits are yeah, worth it, so to speak, because I do think that whilst there's a lot of value in many face-to-face -face interactions, like yeah, teaching, we just discussed it earlier, in fact, and that's, it would be quite nice, actually, at some point to be back to the face-to-face -face world and everything. But I also do see that, um, at least for my work uh, personally, for instance, there are some meetings that in the past I was expected to fly to, for instance, to the UK, which nowadays post-COVID have already been, at least in the post-COVID world, have been already announced that I don't need to do this anymore. So it's it's fine just to do it via Zoom, etc. And this is completely fine for these uh, specific situations there, because I think the value indeed, again, it depends on the specific context, but some value can indeed also be delivered uh, remotely. But I think that's not necessarily airline specific or flight specific, but this is also true for what just um, your regular transportation, like for um, for my daily uh, life, so to speak, I'm also thinking, do I really need to go to Düsseldorf to, to meet someone or can I just um, do that or get that same value out of a um, Zoom chat? Mm -hmm. Sometimes the answer is no, absolutely. Sometimes it is, yeah, sure, if it's anyway just a brief thing, so it's, it's fine. You know, so in that sense, I wouldn't say you need to feel guilty for that, but I think 
one should be a bit more yeah, reflective to what extent it is actually needed, especially in business life later on, right? when you're not really having to pay for the flight yourself. So one might be more tempted perhaps to, to happily book it in or if you, if you travel in general. Um, but yes, yeah, the way the cost and benefit really of it. So that's what it is. Pushing back on kind of this idea of what Zoom can now handle for us when it comes to business specifically. How, how much uh, you know, do you think that this will affect um, the airline industry with regard to business travel? Because business travel is, I don't, I, I don't know the facts, but I know, you know, in last, last minute flight bookings, uh, business class bookings, uh, business travel is huge for the airline mm, industry. Absolutely. So will, how will that affect it? Yeah. So I mean, I've been actually last year, um, I think in, in spring, um, I was part of some yeah, kind of online conference of mostly NGOs who precisely had been uh, looking at that point and wanted to kind of well, construct campaigns around the idea of um, post-COVID to indeed have people um, making more use of, of Zoom and the likes of it so as to reduce uh, travel and also change travel patterns, etc. Um, so as such, um, yeah, I mean, I've, like I said, I think it's it's going to be a mix of things. So some stuff you have to do in person, and there's just no substitute in terms of uh, using Zoom for that. But I do think um, that there will be a lasting impact um, of, of the pandemic on how business is being conducted, right? And uh, also um, my wife, for instance, um, at the moment in her company, everything is being done online, so they're not even allowed to come to office. And it had been already said that um, at least to some extent, these online interactions are being expected at least to, to last also yeah, post-COVID. Uh, because simply now there's the infrastructure and one knows what is working, what maybe is not working so much. So I think, yeah, I can't tell how much the impact will be, but I do think there will be some impact for sure. On this. Yeah, I, th I, th I agree. There, mm. the, there, there is obviously, a, it's a, a, the question you asked, Nicholas, is something that's uh, foremost in the minds of, uh, of airline executives worldwide. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, very, very quick build back of, uh, of travel demand for um, both pure leisure, so, you know, the holiday in Hawaii or whatever, uh, as well as the, 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 the bucket of demand that airline people call VFR, visiting friends and relatives, so personal travel, to go back and see your grandmother uh, or to your, you know, go see your high school friend or attend a wedding or whatever. Those things have come back very, very quickly in the United States. The big question, as you point out, and, 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 and too soon to know is is the return of business travel. And even within that, um, you know, airline marketers, people like you know what I used to do for a living, um, you know, segment the business segment that business travel demand into a bunch of different sub buckets. So you know, these things that like you know, my I have a colleague um, that works for a mid-sized company in in uh, in Kassel in, in Kassel, Germany that makes solar panels. Become, mid-sized company called SMA, you know, his sales team need to get back on plans to go make sales calls in those places where they're expanding. So that's, you know, that's the kind of stuff that builds back pretty quickly. Um, there is some very anecdotal evidence uh, it, because it's too soon to know really numbers wise, but some anecdotal evidence in the United States that a lot of um, meetings and conventions and Congress travel uh, for airlines is a huge chunk of their business, you know, going off to, you know, professional associations or academic associations or interest groups of one kind or another. And, and it's very mixed there. Um, some things are bouncing back very quickly. You know, the professional associations of doctors or lawyers, people with means to go do that, they're doing that. But those associations that are a mix of public employees and private employees, not so much. I think it's really, you know, I've always thought it's dangerous to try to predict when you're in the middle of a crisis how things are going to look when you get out. I think we're going to know a great deal more in a year, even probably in six months, than we do right now. But but Professor Strauss is right. It's going to be, I mean, it's decidedly mixed. And there is no question that there are going to be people uh, on the margins, right? And economists always talk about everything interesting happens on the margins. On the margins, there's going to be people that are going to say, I don't need to make that trip. Um, just a cute story. I was talking to a friend. He's got a buddy who's an investment banker in New York. I mean, a guy with plenty of money, right, to buy a first class ticket to go to London. He said, I used to go to London to see one customer. He says, I'm not doing that anymore. 
So here's a guy where, where, where the cost of travel is no barrier whatsoever. And he said, I'm going to wait. I'm going to do, I'm going to, his threshold is three. So, you know, again, we're going to see this kind of behavior, I think, on the margins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, because I, I, I agree with you in the fact that business travel um, is so much, it, it's so critical to having people be face to face. And when business deal, I, I'm, when I'm, you know, working, being face to face with somebody, it makes a world of difference than being on a video call. Um, however, from the sustainability perspective, this idea that now you can get on Zoom if you only have one customer in London rather than getting on a you know, six hour flight or whatever it is, um, it, that's going to be a huge boost for the sustainability industry. So maybe the, even this COVID idea has, has pushed us into optimizing travel. Yeah, I think that's right. There's, there, look, there's no question uh, that, you know, our are becoming accustomed to, to, to video conferencing and Zoom and, and, and the other platforms um, has, has, has greatly changed the nature, the nature of interaction. And, you know, as we've just talked about in, in sort of anecdotal fashion, um, this is the kind, these are the kinds of decisions that people are going to make. Mm -hmm. And it is going to be interesting going forward to see um, in some of these other areas, you know, uh, you know how quickly things uh, return, if they return at all. Yeah. Um, I'm. Th I mean, I'm. I'm really. I'm thinking, the back to this idea of Congress travel, of meetings and convention travel. You know, it's going to be mixed, but I think there's. I think a lot of that is gonna is gonna come back because that's the, the whole the whole idea of those conferences of an academic conference, right, where mm -hmm. economists or uh, psychologists or you know English literature experts can be face to face. Um, talking about this, you know, these things. I think that I think that's the kind of thing we're pretty hard to do in Zoom. Yeah. And and the kind of the other thing that that the other piece of that um, meetings, you know, any of the any meetings that require sort of intense collaboration, right? Where people really like they're de they're dealing with a document, right? And they've got the document in front of them. Um, a lot of those kinds of things really have to be face to face. Because and that brings to mind this. You know when COP26 happened, and they brought in all the world leaders on their airplanes, and the sustainability community on LinkedIn made a very big deal about how hypocritical it is for world leaders to travel on airplanes to come in and discuss climate policy. I understand their point, but what, yeah, Professor Strauss, I mean, do, what do you think about this, especially when it comes to policy? Is it and we'll get into policy next on especially how policy can be really bad for sustainability. But how um, is it hypocritical? <laughs> well, I think at the end of the day, uh, well, to share another anecdote, uh, I just mentioned this meeting of NGOs discussing precisely how to cut down on air travel. So uh, the original plan indeed was to meet all in Paris, coming from all over the world, um, flying in and to meet them face because there is value in this face to face interaction. It's about also relationship building and everything. Um, they said themselves, okay, it is actually a little bit ironic to say, okay, we need to uh, construct campaigns about how to yeah, reduce business travel and everything. Um, and we ourselves are coming here. So in the end, they actually did it online, but not for the reason you know, that um, it would be you know, more sustainable or something, but simply because at the time, because of COVID, it was just difficult with quarantine rules and the rest of it. Um, so just to say that, um, yeah, the, yeah as uh, you've been saying, but there's things where you really need that relationship building, where you need that face-to-face uh, -face interaction so as such. Yeah, it's just yeah. what it is. So. And <clears throat> on this policy um, thread, this is, uh, it brings me to my next question here, which is Lufthansa has recently made headlines uh, when it revealed that the airline might fly uh, 18,000 empty flights in order to uh, maintain their slots in EU airports. <sighs> it puts the EU in a bind because on one hand, it, it, ensure, uh, it needs to ensure that the airport slots are open to fair competition, which is, of course, uh, beneficial to everybody, um, allowing you know, newcomers to uh, vie for them if, if they're not used sufficiently. However, on the other hand, it also keeps... Uh, <laughs> It's obvious it, you're flying empty planes to keep slots. Um, how should airlines and regulatory bodies balance this dilemma between keeping fair markets, but also making sure we're not flying 18,000 empty flights 
and burning jet fuel. Yeah, I mean, this is just nuts. Uh, and, and it's just it's one of those situations that that, that just points up, um, you know, inconsistencies in policies and that sort of thing, because you're exactly right, Nicholas, in an, in an ideal world, you know, you want enough infrastructure uh, to uh, to accommodate uh, existing demand and, and, and plan for growth. Um, and, and you, and, and, and you want to be able to allow fair competition and people not to sort of sit on slots and all these kinds of stuff, but in a, you know, in a, in, in a world where policy is not going to change, if I'm Lufthansa group, I'm, I mean, sad as it is, I mean, and they can, they're going to get skewered by, you know, the environmental community. And I guess they'll have to take that because, you know, absent, um, any kind of enlightenment uh, on, on 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 policy, um, they want to be able to keep those keep those slots, and they and because you know down the road if they lose those slots, um, they won't be able to offer the pattern of service that they believe the marketplace wants. So it's it's it's, it's it, the whole question of slot controls has always been um, just really head hurting for me, uh, and 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 I mean I feel badly for you know, the, anybody that has to sort of make these kinds of decisions, because I mean, you point out the, you know, the obvious, um, you know, inconsistencies in this whole, in this whole thing. And it really is, you know, it really is head hurting. Um, we actually have our first, by the way, I'll address the audience real quick. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question, we are taking live comments, uh, from the audience anywhere in the, in the world on whatever platform we are streaming on. Um, I do have one here. Let's see if this works. Oh, 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 there we go. So what do you think of air taxi concepts like Lilium and Volocopter? And in fact, this actually gets to a my, our, our last question that we're going to ask tonight, which is the, what the future of airline looks like. So maybe we, we should leave this. But in, in general, what do you think? Well, I mean, we're looking. We're not talking. We're talking about apples and oranges here. Yeah. Between you know a twelve thousand kilometer flight uh, on Lufthansa from Frankfurt to the Far East, uh, and hopping on some electric powered uh, little whizzing thing that's going to take me from you know from 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 here to uh, to Bonn. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's, I mean, it's a, so just having said that, um, we're talking about many different markets. Yes, both things fly, uh, but let's be a little bit more discriminating here in what we're talking about. Now, having said all that, as a kind of cranky uh, 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 preamble, um, these come, there's, look at, there's a ton of, companies coming into the marketplace, and Professor Strauss knows this, uh, that, that, that are having all kinds of ideas. And in, in, back in the U.S., the, the, the amount of capital is flooding into these companies is just staggering. I mean, the market cap of some of these companies that don't even have a viable product manufactured, much less certified, is just staggering. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a little bit of sort of, uh, you know, whiz-bang, high-tech kinds of things. Um, Somebody builds one uh, that can be certified by EASA here in the here in Europe, uh, the, the safety regulatory agency here in the EU. Uh, that can be certified by the FAA in the United States, and then accepted certifications by other countries, uh, and and can provide a a viable economical product that obviously initially is going to be attractive only to rich people. Let's be very clear. Um, good for them. You know, but there's a but between here and any one of these companies that says we're going to have this ready in X amount of time, somebody like me that spent a lifetime in aviation is a little bit skeptical. Mm. Build it, certify it, market it, and let's talk then in whatever time period it is. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think even beyond that, so even if it gets certified at some point, I mean, this is indeed one major obstacle to, to overcome. You still have got the obstacle of actually finding enough pilots to really scale this up because um, especially for a small aircraft there's already now a shortage of pilots and on top mm -hmm. of that um, well these companies are also announcing that they're actively working of course on um, fully autonomous um, um, yeah, vehicles which also doesn't make it much more attractive for pilots to pursue a career there much so yeah <laughs> as such that's the problem and then thirdly, the infrastructure challenge, so especially for air taxis. And if you really want to use it as a taxi service, like within a large city or something, you would need a lot of um, well, landing spots and you would also need uh, servicing spots and, and things yeah. like that. Um, and these things, especially in a more urban environment, are going to be rather expensive. And exactly as, um, as you just said, right? so it's going to be 
super expensive if you want to maintain a dense network of such points, such as to enable a taxi-ish kind of service where people can yeah, just walk within yeah, five minutes or so to their to the actual destination that they seek. It's going to be a service that is costing at the level, presumably, of today's helicopter rise, and as such, indeed, as really just something for high net worth individuals. So it's not going to be a, well, a sustainable solution, the sense of that even for you, maybe flying that with 100% um, green energy or whatever, but it's not going to be a mass transport solution for sure. Mm -hmm. And even, even uh, for those, so like there was a study, I think 2019 in Nature, about uh, the sustainability of these services, looking specifically at a I think 100 kilometer trip with three passengers um, in one of these devices. Um, and they compare that with a um, internal combustion engine vehicle and a battery electric vehicle. And um, well, they showed some improvements in terms of emissions um, over both of these. But with the battery electric vehicle, it was just, I think, five, six percentage or so. But excluding all the manufacturing costs of the batteries, and if you think yeah. about what kind of batteries yeah, that these the... kind of things need and how much emissions are actually involved in the production of this, mm. you are probably uh, um, actually much worse than uh, It's like than the that. idea with so, the you know, e-scooters, uh, manufacturing yeah. of the e-scooters. Yeah, being no, 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 yeah, I mean, it, it, I think, what, you know, again, you know, one of these um, um, kind of ideas hiding in plain sight is whenever we're talking about something that's going to fly, no matter what it is, it's going to fly. It's going to, you know, we're going to have to uh, defy gravity, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 that act of defying gravity, whether it's a it's a, it's a, it's a little drone uh, that your child uh, flies around the backyard, or it's a uh, it's a it's a Boeing seven seven seven. It requires a lot of energy to defy gravity, and uh, you know, at the end of the day. Um, you know, pushing something along a railway track uh, at a high speed is going to inherently be, you know, uh, uh, require a lot less energy. So, you know, you have to sort of factor these things in. And I think there's a, you know, there tends to be, um, you know, this sort of gee whiz factor about some of this new technology and, 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 and scientists uh, and professors like, like, like uh, Professor Strauss and, and, and business people like me sort of say, well, yeah, okay, yeah, that's kind of cool, but let's be a little bit sober about how uh, this is going to actually work out in practice. You know, I'd like to go back to something you said, Professor Strauss, about the pilots. I don't know where I had read this, but it, it was something in, in the U.S., a, a majority of our pilots are actually coming ex-military from, you know, they were fighting Vietnam. I don't know what it is now. I don't even know if this is correct, but there is a lack of pilots in the U.S. and in Europe. Um, what, why, first of all, and second of all, how, do, how is the, what is the solution to that? But yeah, I'll I'll jump in here because I think the 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 the, the pilot shortage in the United States gets the most visibility. Um, there's a couple of things going on here, and and like any labor market, um, it's complicated, right? There's never you know one little thing that explains all of it, but but a couple of things are first of all um, the military. You were you were right in the past, Nicholas. The, the military historically was the most reliable producer uh, of civilian airline pilots. Um, things have changed. The Cold War is over. Other things are happening. Defense spending is down worldwide. So the military is not churning out the same number of sort of Luftwaffe Air Force people as it, as, as it was once upon a time. Um, so you've got that. Um, and so actually civilian paths into the uh, into the airline industry were the, were the ways this was were going. Now, for many years, uh, as the as the military declined in importance, a number of uh, universe, colleges and universities in the United States started creating actually college degree programs. Um, and there are, I think, a hundred of them in the United States at places like Purdue University, University of North Dakota, where you can get a, a university degree, a bachelor's degree, learn something about the air transport uh, industry and get a pilot's license at the same time. That path was working very, very well for a while. Um, things got a little bit complicated in the U.S. starting about 15 years ago. And again, this is a market economy, supply and demand, and pressure on uh, the airlines that operate these smaller aircraft, which is the way that it comes in. And wages started going down. 
And this is actually more like 20 to a 20 to 30 year problem. And so for a long, long time, um, you really had to want to be uh, a, an airline pilot in the United States to want to take those jobs because entry level jobs uh, in a regional airline uh, flying, say, a 50 passenger jet, salaries were like in the 20,000 to mid 20s. I mean, they were astonishingly low. Mm -hmm. And and the path to a promotion into a bigger airline was very slow. And so all of a sudden that that pipe, those pipelines start to dry up. And so the marketplace now, and there's always a lag in labor markets, right? There's always a lag. People are sort of, you know, the academics, the smart people that are looking at this thing going, we you know we're heading into trouble and the business people are going, yeah, it's going to be okay. Well, so now we are in the United States, you know, in the situation where there is an identified shortage. Also, part of it has to do with demography, people aging out, lots of retirements coming up among the, among the bigger airlines. So all these things taken together create something of a shortage, which every airline executive in the United States looks at and goes, wow. So there's a solution to this. It's called money. OK, so what's happened is that now you start to see these salaries rising pretty dramatically at these in these these entry level positions, which is a great thing. Right. Uh, because you're now attracting a lot more people into the business. And there's a lot of other things, a lot of other dynamics involved in that. But that's sort of probably more than the audience wants to know. But it's complicated. Mm -hmm. It's complicated. Now, I suspect, again, being you know, being a believer in uh, in the, the beauty of the market economy is that as you raise compensation, you're going to you're going to solve this problem in, in you know three to five years, mm -hmm. and also supposed to support people in the training cost because presumably even before you even can start earning, and there's quite a, a lot of training cost to be paid for actually gaining your license, which of course if you're gaining that in the military or something then that's fine, but uh, if you indeed have to pay it privately before that and um, so before actually starting with your actual job. Well, that's quite an expense to make, and um, as I understand it, at least that's one of the big obstacles, especially for these small aircraft operators. Um, yeah, but really, a potential pilot is thinking twice whether or not to, yeah. to take that career. Exactly. Point. Uh, it's the same thing happening with the medical industry too. <laughs> you know, in lots of stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's a, it's it's not it's not a unique problem. That's for sure. We have one question from the audience ah. related to um, money, I guess. Um, should governments increase airline taxes to force people to use trains? Now, I don't know how this will affect, uh, this question imposes on your economic and liberal versus non-liberal theory of economics, but Professor Strauss, what do you think? Well, that's a difficult one. I guess at the end of the day, if you purely want to drive the um, um, for climate change uh, agenda, climate protection agenda, then presumably, um, well, this, this might be way indeed of well, trying to incentivize people uh, to rather stay away from travel. But then again, I also think, uh, well, especially much business travel, which is rather time critical. Um, I don't quite see that even with higher taxes, you would be able to, to, to push people in that direction because they simply, but time is money and, uh, you know, to, to raise taxes to a level where um, this is, well, really an incentive for it then to, to spend a day on a train or something, or, you know, to, to yeah. travel there. Um, that's going to be uh, um, going to be difficult to achieve. Um, so I think this would be mostly um, then targeted towards those those leisure trips, such that people are thinking twice whether they are going to take Ryanair to, to fly to whatever the holiday destination, because now instead of costing you know, 100 euros, now it might be substantially uh, more expensive. Uh, so something like that, I could imagine that there is quite a big impact, but at the end of the day for business. I, I mean, it works with tobacco, but mm -hmm. it seems also like this is a very European-centered issue, well, where you have an option of trains, whereas in many places yeah, like the U.S. Yeah, you, you can't take the train to New York. Yeah. Uh, from here, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, and there's and there's a number. I mean, there are, really are a number of, of, of issues Not here. Yet. And Professor Strauss is 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 is, is really um, articulated, you know, some of the challenges that are involved in this. Um, I, I must say, and, and this may be a function of the fact that I live uh, in Washington, D.C., um, but I, I've become, and it's also probably a function of, of my old age, uh, but I've become in my old age a little bit cynical, more than a little bit cynical, about the prospect of enlightened public policy 
the, the, the notion that we could do something uh, that would actually, you know, using, you know, using um, fiscal policy, using tax policy, actually change people's behavior uh, in a way that made sense, in a way that did not disproportionately punish people in one country or, or another. For example, you know, here in the EU, you know, if, if it was possible, you can't, you know, tax policy is national, right? So you can't have, uh, not can't, but unlikely to have uniform national tax policy, harmonized tax policies across the entire EU. So they're doing one thing in Germany, another thing in Italy, another thing in France, another thing in Poland. So, you know, it's, it's hard. And then, you know, the other challenge, of course, is that, you know, we're talking about a global problem. And so every so often, you know, uh, the, you know, the United Nations arm that looks after civil aviation called ICAO gets involved in these things. And, but it's just really challenging because, you know, we've got you're right, Nicholas. We've got these sort of we may have a, a, a you know a, a Eurocentric point of view that doesn't uh, register or make any sense to someone who lives in another part of the world. And if I could just get a little cranky for a moment, you know, one of the things that really disturbs me is when rich Europeans point the finger at somebody that wants to fly in India. Right, um, a middle class family in Hyderabad finally have enough money to take a holiday uh, and come to Europe uh, to see the Eiffel Tower or whatever. And somebody's pointing her finger or his finger at these people saying this is evil. I think it's racist, frankly, at, at the end of the day uh, for people to get into those things. So just to provoke you a little bit, there's a lot of things going on here uh, that when people say, well, you know, we don't want people to fly, I think it becomes challenging for, as I said, rich, and I'm not going to say rich Europeans, rich Americans for the same way yep. to say, okay, these people shouldn't be able to fly. So, you know, again, you know, we're back to where I began at the beginning. You know, everyone makes a decision on consumption. Uh, do they want to do this or not do this? They look at what air travel gives us and they make a decision. And I think I'm, I'm very skeptical of governments imposing those kinds of things on the ability of people to travel. Yeah. Professor Strauss, to not change the subject entirely, but on Coming back to what does sustainability mean in the airline industry, uh, we talked about this earlier. I, I think there's two main levers to pull. It's the uh, the engineering of the aircraft itself, but also the way that the aircraft is managed. And Professor Strauss, you uh, you are an expert on on this, so I, I direct this question at you. Mm -hmm. um, you've written about the uh, potential emission savings that can be achieved by improving the service of air traffic management and uh, partnering with cross-border air traffic control systems. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on, on how improving that management and collaborating, um, you know, spe specifically mm -hmm. in this issue within the EU, co collaborating between uh, EU mm -hmm. member countries um, can actually make airlines, uh, the airline industry more sustainable and how sustainable? Absolutely. So actually, it ties in to what you just mentioned about um, the regulatory framework in Europe and well, its fragmented nature, because that's precisely the issue uh, with air traffic management as well, specifically in Europe. So I yeah, probably should start first to briefly explain what actually air traffic control is all about. Uh, so essentially, the, um, uh, the thing is that, well, apparently you've got these air traffic controllers in every country sitting there, um, ensuring the safety of the flights, like separation, everything. Well, and um, this, of course, doesn't come for free, but in Europe, we're talking about, I think, 6.8 billion euros or so annually being spent on air traffic control. So it's, it's not cheap at all. And it's been organized uh, nationally. I mean, there is a network manager, but uh, that's more of a supervisory role, so to speak. They don't have much uh, executive power. Essentially, the national authorities are looking after their respective airspaces and um, well, are managing those. Now, the idea is essentially at the moment um, that what well, this cost is being well, compensated for ultimately by us, where people are flying around by means of paying our ticket prices, because part of that ticket price indeed is being paid by the airlines then to those um, air traffic uh, control centers with these navigation uh, providers, uh, so as to, to cover that cost. Um, well, and um, the problem specifically here is then, well, that first of all, um, it's actually not always well the cheapest for the airline to fly the shortest distance, uh, interestingly enough, uh, but rather to take some detours or to avoid certain airspaces because every 
airspace of every country has got different prices attached to it in the sense that if an airline wants to fly through there, they would need to pay, yeah, if they're flying through Switzerland and Germany or whatever, um, they would need to pay each country a certain fee that depends on the size or rather the weight of the aircraft, how long they are flying there, um, and well, ultimately this, this unit rate that the individual country is setting. So there you've got the interesting effects that some countries are having fairly high charges because there are high costs in that country, Switzerland, for instance, meaning that as an airline, I've got a high incentive if I would fly with the shortest um, or most uh, fuel efficient trajectory through the Swiss airspace that I'm actually better off flying around Switzerland so as to save on costs mm -hmm. with these charges and that's still saving me money uh, despite having actually more, um, more fuel burn. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the issues. Another issue is the, the capacity, what's in the sense of um, even for, if you're looking into the sky, we get the impression that there's tons of space there. Actually, in certain areas, that's not the case in as far as that these controllers each have got a certain well, three-dimensional chunk of, of airspace called a sector under their control. And the idea is really that um, they only, in order to maintain overview and well, ensure safety of all the flights, uh, there's a maximum number of flights allowed into that sector within a given time unit, like half an hour or something like that. Um, which means, well, if there is not enough controllers in the right place at the right time, well, that you also then have got this effect that uh, even for in principle, there would be space to, to fly through, you're not allowed to, you have to fly around it simply because of these capacity issues. And at the same time, actually, overall, we've got lots of capacity across Europe, just not always at the right time in the right place. Right? So that's the, that's the, um, the second issue. And those two things, essentially, we have been looking at um, in actually two um, um, project um, funded by the European Commission, so one is uh, currently running. It's also Eurocontrol as part of that project, by the way, which is the European Network Manager. Um, yeah, and indeed, it's the proposal there is indeed first of all regarding that that route charge and really to completely ditch all those um, individual yeah, country-specific charges, but rather look at charges that just depend on what the city pairs between you are flying thereby removing any incentive to um, fly anything but the, the most fuel efficient route, really. <coughs> and secondly, what to look at options of um, what these different air navigation service providers of different countries really to work together and for share capacities to some extent, right? because like this, you would then be able to avoid the situation of, well, in principle, across Europe, there'd be plenty of, of controllers. But like I said, so if the shortage, for instance, is in Germany in certain sectors there, that they could get some support from, from, let's say, France or something, because technically this is possible. This is, in fact, in Estonia and Finland, there's a corporation, so they're actually planning their um, air traffic controller rostering together. They're also um, yes, and switching capacities back and forth in the sense that the controller could be sitting in Finland controlling part of Estonian airspace. That's not a problem technically at all. But um, yeah, so it's it's not easily done because well, <laughs> but this this actually ties into a question here that I'll put on the screen. Um, what I wanted to uh, elaborate on is just, first, uh, this is Dare Demon AOE. Uh, to to what degree will sustainability impact the current and future strategies in the airline market? I will take this question and 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 pose it in a different way. To what extent does sustainability play an impact on? you know, on, on these cross-border um, collaborations, hmm. because when, whenever there's a cross-border collaboration, it means you take away the autonomy of, of the individual com country. So hmm. Switzerland is now uh, in, in the pursuit of sustainability, hmm. collaborating with airspace. Now they don't get what they used to get in terms of hmm. autonomy for being able to control their own airspace. So how, hmm. how do you yes, respond to that? Exactly. So. And for that reason, what we actually propose, and there is indeed a more centralized uh, planning approach, which by itself is actually not a new thing. So for quite a few years, what well, this has been tried to uh, well, to be realized um, somehow in Europe, but because of national resistance, I mean, sovereignty is basically the main thing that um, um, poses obstacles there. This so far hasn't come to pass. So I mean, that would be the ideal thing, in my view, is basically like in the US, that you've got one central authority that is controlling um, the entire thing and planning capacity essentially in everything. Um, but I think the next best solution and really one that I believe is possible is really this um, well, th this cross-border collaboration. And I think sustainability really is now well, something that really can push this. In fact, we just last week um, 
had a working paper um, submitted precisely on that topic. So what is the sustainability impact of having these cross-border arrangements and things um, as you know, one argument in favor of uh, actually getting that to work, um, especially because with these smaller um, corporations, it's more likely to work because then indeed um, these providers, well, what does one also has to say, that different providers across Europe are actually using different software systems, right? So it <laughs> makes it then also hard to collaborate. Uh, but not all of them have been different ones, but um, but all of them have the same one. Um, so as such that one could actually imagine alliances being formed between ANSBs with similar cost structures, uh, similar well, software tools that they're using, similar training, therefore, as such, that should be working. And especially with the sustainable um, sustainability argument, I would hope at least that in the near future, this is actually something that really yeah, is something that politicians will get behind and actually make possible. But mm -hmm. And I think another another thing that we should point out, um, that Professor Strauss has done a great job of explaining, you know, sort of Im improvements in the management of, of the existing air traffic control regime. Um, the audience may be surprised to know that underpinning uh, this entire system is a technology that's almost 100 years old. We are still using radar. Now, radar was wonderful technology in the 1930s, but you know, your smartphone has more location sophistication and an awful lot of the technology that underpins air traffic control. And so if we're talking about you know, where we really need to be going, um, I mean, not there's and there's no single solution. I mean, Professor Strauss is talking about, you know, fixing incrementally some things that very much need to be fixed within the context of the existing technology. Very few people have been uh, have been ready to take the steps necessary to move us towards GPS uh, as as a way to control. If we had GPS control instead of radar, we would be able to use airspace much more efficiently, we would be able to enhance sustainability remarkably mm -hmm. because we would get around a lot of these funky barriers and um, diseconomies that Professor Strauss has articulated. So, you know, Why are and, we and, using it? well, because there's a lot of, well, for a lot of reasons, including institutional inertia, including unwillingness to get the entire, you know, to do this, the whole world has to agree that's a hard thing to do, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so we're mm -hmm. so we're we're sort of hamstrung, and we can make little tweaks along the way. We can we can we can augment the radar-based system with some GPS, and a lot of people are doing that, and that's great. But we have not yet figured out a way to say, okay, you know, on March the first, twenty twenty-six, the entire world will stop using radar and start using GPS, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean or even just for um, for the EU. I mean, it's Wouldn't that be years like ago they had been setting up this single European Sky program, and put uh, billions of money in, into that with the precise hope of actually achieving some higher technology standard across uh, the whole of Europe. But instead, actually, um, quite a big chunk of that money ultimately went into just yeah, some improvements of the local systems, but um, for just across the borders, it's really difficult because of these national interests. But it's at the end of the day, it's mostly um, politics and opposing interests we have different stakeholders i think the airlines um and the european uh, commission they are probably both aligned in as far as that they really would want really a, a more sustainable solution and well, which also would be much cheaper at the end of the day um but yeah like i said it's more the the other stakeholders yeah. which are less necessarily involved in that or exactly. uh, excited exactly. about that. well to get away from this mm -hmm. anchor of politics and national interests that is holding us back from this beautiful sustainable future that we all envision um i'd like us to think about that and from your expert perspectives um i'm i'm, I'm taking this uh in, in newsletter every week called not every every week it's every day actually uh, called concept of mind and i swear for the past month it's been company after company that is making either a new highly uh you know, a new material for to make airlines more lighter and and more sustainable, or a VTOL startup, or this new um, there's a I think a new British um, startup that is I think it's called UAP that's making these landing pads all around Europe for uh, vertical takeoff and landing craft. So my question is, uh, we've witnessed this this explosion of investment going into these different startups, which we touched upon earlier, um, companies like Lilium, Zuri, Ziva, 
HG Robotics, UAP, um, they're all working to prepare the world for a paradigm shift in air travel. So what, what does, and I'll start with you, Professor Starr, what does the future of air travel look like to you? Well, I think it depends on what's kind of what was mentioned earlier, right? So in the sense of what travel we are talking about, is it the long distance travel or is it really rather... I would say both. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so I think for the very short um, flights in the sense of intra-city or inter-city, so one, from, from one city to the next, but you know, just talking about 100 or 200 kilometers at uh, max. Um, so there I, I can indeed see a market um, yeah, for these uh, for these VTOLs. And so there are some of them specifically designed um, but to have lots of different yeah, rotors, but no wings, so they are having great uh, lift and everything. Uh, also great efficiency at, at hovering, so they are perfectly suited for operation within the cities, uh, whereas others, like the one from Lilium, I think it is, um, that is having wings as well, so hence um, it's also better suited for, uh, it's, let's say, medium distances. So there is going to be some of that, um, as we discussed, but it's going to be still a niche market, I believe. Um, and for, as for the long distance travel, I think well, there's no alternative but to go on as we have it at the moment, basically for quite a while, because whilst there is a lot of work going into um, what sustainable aviation fuels, both on the engineering side as well as on the production side, and it's going to be a huge investment to actually scale up production of these fuels to the level that it actually would be needed. And at the moment, it's you know um, next to nothing, mm. <laughs> and um, as yeah. such. And it's also quite energy intensive, actually, to, to produce those. So you need a lot of renewable energy sources, a lot of electricity to go into, um, yeah, into, into produce. What about energy. hydrogen fuel? Um, yeah, for instance, right? so you need quite a bit of energy actually to, to produce them in the first instance. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I, I do feel that, well, this is quite promising in the long run. But you know, the very mm -hmm. long run. I mean, it's going to take quite a while, and until then, I don't see much of an alternative, really. Um, yeah, so for the things mentioned, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, I think that and the, the, that word alternative is a really good is a really good word because I think one of the things that uh, uh, a you know somebody that's been in the business for a long, long time understands, like me, uh, is that. Um, you know, for now, I mean, it, yes, as I said at the beginning, everyone's working on this, but it's going to take a while. And mm -hmm. Professor mm -hmm. Strauss has just said that it's going to take a while. Um, and and there are, you know, in, in, in the world of ground transportation, whether they're talking about trucks or, or cars or railways, that because they are on the ground, right, because they are on the ground and they are not defying gravity, um, there are, you know, the, the, the movement towards electric, and it's already happened here in the Deutsche Bahn, for example, the movement towards electric is already a reality for the railways uh, on main lines. It's a reality for the automobile sector. I mean, you know, I turn on the TV at home and um, when I see uh, Daimler-Benz is doing, doing no advertising in the United States virtually except for their electric vehicles. So it's all moving in that direction, trucks and buses and all that stuff. The airplane is in the situation where absent the ability, as Professor Strauss says, to scale up sustainable aviation fuels, we're going to use petroleum. Now, maybe that means that the petroleum that we're not using in motor cars and trucks could be sensibly allocated towards airplanes, because for now, that's what we have. Everyone's working to make a difference, but let's be realistic. If you want to get to Hong Kong in 10 hours tomorrow, it's going to require petroleum. And, you know, people can wring their hands about that and complain about fossil fuels and blame Exxon or do whatever. But, you know, the alternatives are not there yet. And hydrogen, you know, everyone says, you know, okay, what about hydrogen? And, you know, sometimes the naivete is just stunning to me because the hydrogen doesn't grow on trees. Hydrogen has to be made. Now, as far as anyone can tell, the only really viable way to make hydrogen at scale uh, is with a fusion reaction. OK, by taking the energy of the sun and That's bringing it down to Earth and having a power plant. Now, I'm an optimist. We're getting very close to being able to build a small reactor that works that. And if they can do it at, at small scale and start to scale it up, we're going to be there. But we're still, I'm guessing, 10, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years away from from that reality. 
Okay, that's going to be a great thing. That's going to be in your lifetime, not mine. But that's a great, and everyone's working on that. But the high, you know, let's be realistic. It's not going to be tomorrow. And you know, and, so fusion for the purpose of boiling water to generate electricity to create hydrogen to power planes. Well, you there's all kinds of other ways you can. There's yeah, yeah. There's lots of other. And 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 by the way, just so that we can introduce yet another science lesson, and all of you, everyone in the audience has taken physics in gymnasium or high school. Um, if we have hydrogen, if we have uh, the ability to generate almost unlimited amounts of absolutely clean energy, guess what? The planet is still going to warm, right? Because the process of the process of combusting energy, a process of combusting hydrogen, hydrogen and oxygen, it's going to produce heat. So, I mean, there's no holy grail. I would close it then because, um, <laughs> On this idea of the future, I just read this last week that I, I forget where and I forget who it was, but they are, I think it was NASA. They are now trying to bring back the Concorde, bring back uh, supersonic flight. What is your opinion on supersonic flight? You want me to go first? Yeah. All right. Um, well, if, if, if people, if, if there are people in the audience that um, are crazed about commercial aviation and sustainability, the prospect of supersonic flight should make them even more crazed because it is astonishingly energy intensive. Yeah. Okay. And it's just, again, folks, it's just back to physics from high school or gymnasium, right? You can go faster than about a thousand kilometers an hour, but to do so requires a lot of energy. So these companies, and again, this isn't, we haven't touched on this yet, but there's enormous amounts of venture capital flowing into three or four companies in the United States that are building smaller supersonic transports, right? Now they would obviously like to prove it at a small level and then scale it up so they could build an airliner. Enormous amounts of energy. There's no way around that. It's going to pollute more. Let's be very clear, okay? And uh, for, uh, for, for an additional area of concern, supersonic aircraft typically fly higher. And so you're putting more emissions higher up in the atmosphere, which is even more damaging. Okay. okay. So I'm, you know, I always say to my whiz bang friends that are talking to me about supersonic travel, I say, okay, really? Um, why don't we just get used to the fact that we can get to New York uh, in eight hours, read a book, watch a movie. It's pretty fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Strauss, yeah, anything to add? Really, no, that's <laughs> the, the, the main reason the Concorde didn't, I, you know, I'm so, uh, you guys lived in, in the era of the Concorde where you get from New York to London in three hours, but or wherever it was. But the, I think the main, and correct me if I'm wrong, the main reason it was shut down was because uh, of the noise pollution. Well, it was a couple of things. I mean, to be to be clear, and and again, this is this this will directly come into into play with any supersonic plane that is that is developed. If they if they build it, if it's scalable, if it's it's going to be incredibly expensive to operate. Mm -hmm. And the Concorde, uh, which was you know from the 1960s, uh, you know a, te a technology miracle in that era. Um, the technology was op the airplane, the Concorde was operated by two airlines. Uh, British Airways and its predecessor, and Air France. Neither company made 10 cents mm, flying that airplane. It was prestige. It was, a, uh, it was a buffer to the brand. It was awesome, but it was expensive. And noisy. And it was noisy. 100 people, 100 <laughs> people, 100 people, all first class. Yeah. I mean, the rest of us are going to be in economy class, people. Yeah. Uh, no. There you go. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot, you know, and again. So why are they just, working on it? I wonder. Well, that, well, because that was because, because, because there are enough people that, uh, as Professor Strauss politely they say, high net worth individuals like Mark Zuckerberg or somebody who's going to have one of these airplanes to start with. Those folks are going to buy them and fly them and get where they need to go in a hurry. The rest of us. 900 so kilometers an hour, baby, and ha have a, you know, have a drink on the way and watch a movie and, and it'll be fine. <laughs> or, or fine. <laughs> yeah. well, but that, I mean, so, I mean, that's just, it's yeah. just physics. At yeah. the end of the day, it's just physics. Well, we can't get that nuclear fusion fast enough. <laughs> Truly that. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us here tonight. Um, to our audience around the globe, uh, 
thank you. And tune in next time to Veha'u Inside Business. Uh, we'll be hosting perspectives, uh, hopefully every semester. But um, until then, uh, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you.